Um, hi everyone. Uh, I hope you can you can hear me. Uh, we will get started in just a minute or two. I see there's already quite a lot of you here. So after uh, last month's uh, webinar on um, on how to cope with anxiety and and COVID nineteen and a very warm reception that we got with that uh, webinar. Uh, the folks at SkinPick decided to make it a monthly thing. So from now on, every month there will there will be a free webinar on a different topic related to um, skin picking. So for this month, um, we decided to talk about what what it means to pick your skin. What is the meaning of symptoms in skin picking? Um, this is in part because um, in the last uh, webinar uh, and afterwards, I received a bunch of emails asking me about the psychological aspects of it, um, and especially the um, the self compassion side of um, of skin picking. It seems to have been very <laughs> controversial, and, re and I, I received mixed reviews for that in the sense ranging from yes that is exactly what i need to what do you mean self-compassion when i'm picking my skin so i decided to maybe devote this webinar to talk a little bit about what is behind skin picking um, i will like last time try to wrap everything up in about 45 minutes and then you can ask me uh, anything that you like uh, I would, I would ask you though to use the uh, Q&A button to ask questions. There is a chat option in a Q&A button, so please use the, the Q&A button because it's, uh, it's much easier to see and manage all the questions. Um, so let's, let's get started with our agenda for today. So first I'm just going to say a few words about skin picking. Uh, uh, because the um, the company uploads these to YouTube later, and um, apparently there are people who come across these and they would like to get some uh, sort of basic, you know, explanation about what skin picking is and how it's diagnosed. So that's going to be just one or two slides. Uh, then I'm going to talk about what is meaning anyway, and why is it that we psychotherapists are obsessed with it. And then we're going to talk about how to discover what picking means. Because one of the things that I emphasized last time, and those of you that work with me know that I tend to emphasize is, is, is sort of the personal aspect of, of all of it. There is no universal meaning to skin picking. Um, so in that sense, I'm going to talk about different ways in which you can discover, or at least try to discover on your own what picking means. Uh, in, in a way, that's 90% of what therapy is, figuring out what things mean. Uh, I will try to be brief with all of these because I would like to devote a little more time um, to a case study. I would like to present a case, my work with a client, um, and focus on how we came to understand what picking meant for her by analyzing um, different aspects of picking, when she was picking, when she wasn't, what was triggering, what wasn't triggering, and uh, more importantly, what is it that we did with that meaning and how that helped her heal and, and move on. And then like last time, um, we are going to uh, do the uh, Q&A session. So just a sort of note for everyone, uh, you can of course ask anything related to the, to the presentation. And you can ask anything you would like to know about picking in general. There's no, there's no limitation about what you can ask or how many questions you can ask. The planned time for this is about one hour. However, uh, last time I think, uh, last time I think we went for about, for about two hours. So, um, depending on the number of questions, I will of course um, finish my part hopefully quickly. So let's start first with, uh, with what exactly is skin picking and I will try to keep it brief. Um, so um, dermatillomania or excoriation disorder is just simply this repeated urge uh, to pick one's own skin. 
uh, and er sort of an urge to pick which then causes psychological and physical damage. The definition is really rather simple. Uh, for most people, although not for all of them, uh, picking is preceded by this sense of tension accumulating, which then culminates with the urge to pick. And then uh, what follows is a sort of sense of release uh, and also a great sense of shame and, and, and guilt. And whereas sometimes urges tend to pop up just unexpectedly, this mix of gratification and, and guilt is something that I see, I think, in almost every case. And that's also, I think, sort of an indicator that meaning that, that sorry, that picking uh, is not just this bad habit, but it's also something that does something, hence the gratification, but it's also something that you should be getting in a different way, hence the guilt. So it's, it's quite a complex sort of interplay be between something that we need and something that we really don't want. But psychologically speaking, there have been different theories, although, as you know, there aren't, uh, there aren't, uh, there's not a lot of, uh, sorry, uh, can you please confirm if you can hear me? Oh, okay, thank you, because someone just sent a message saying they can't hear me. Thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, psychologically speaking, uh, as you all probably know, uh, there's not a lot of research uh, that's related to picking. And so you have a lot of these little theories and little studies and, and case reports. So some will connect uh, picking to different parenting styles and, you know, in the childhood. Some will connect it to traumatic events, some to abuse, uh, to intense emotions, or sort of not being able to cope with intense emotions and so on. But there are many, many, many theories like these, but there, there are very few studies that actually systematically undertake to classify them. There's also, as always, a biological side to picking, and I thought that might be a good topic to discuss next time because this is only one webinar. We can't really make it that comprehensive. Um, so next month we'll talk about sort of more neurological and biological approaches, and we'll talk about what that means for therapy. Today we will talk about these psychological issues, only I will try to avoid uh, saying things like picking is caused by traumatic events because everyone has a different story about how they started picking and some may involve traumatic events, some may not. So I will try to talk in more general terms about um, how meaning arises, how, sorry, how picking arises from our experiences. That's what I will be focusing on in the first part. And then in the second part, I will try to tell you a story about picking through uh, by presenting a case. And then you will see specifically for that person how, how picking was uh, specifically connected to uh, different parenting styles. In DSM, it's classified as being related to OCD. Um, and the diagnostic criteria are really nothing uh, to write home about. So recurrent skin picking that results in skin lesions, it's something that causes significant distress or impairment for the person. And it's not something that's caused by a dermatological or other uh, conditions. Okay, someone else comments on my voice. I apologize. I will try to lean forward a little bit, uh, maybe because the microphone is far away. So that's, I think, all uh, that's all I meant to say about sort of what skin picking is in general. So now let's just sort of jump into the, into what's the topic at hand. Um, as you see, I like to put these quotes here and there, and they're really never random. Um, the one that I chose for this section is is one by Freud, where he says, everywhere I go, I, found, I find a poet has been there before me. I really like this, and you will see how true and useful this is in, in just a minute. I will not be talking about all these people, uh, but I, will, I do feel the need to name them. So left to right, of course, it all starts with Sigmund Freud. Uh, the lady next to him is Melon Klein. The man next to her is Viktor Frankl. Frankl wrote a very good book called Man's Search for Meaning. So if you ever want to, write, to read more about meaning and psychology, that's a, that's a nice book to start. Next to him is Jacques Lacan, the uh, 
famously uh, incomprehensible French psychoanalyst, then Stephen Mitchell, who was also a very famous psychoanalyst. He invented something we call relational psychoanalysis. And then these two guys that I will be talking a little more about. The first one is Paul Watzlawick. He was a, and I, I may miss something, he was a German, Austrian, Italian, American psychiatrist. So it was a, had a very complicated life. And then George Kelly. I talked about Kelly last time, and it is very likely that if you see my face, I will mention Kelly at least once. And then uh, lonely below is John Dewey, perhaps the greatest American philosopher. So what do all these people have in common? I mean, if you, if you had this sort of alternate timeline where you could put them all at a, at a, at a dinner table and you know, have them talk, they would probably end up throwing food at each other because they would not agree on, on a lot. Uh, Lacan idolized Freud, but I think I have a very strong sense that if Freud ever tried to read Lacan, he would burn his books. Freud also didn't have a good relationship to Melanie Klein. He did not like her modifying his theories. So they wouldn't agree. Uh, Kelly was highly critical to Freud. Uh, Stephen Mitchell also departed from Freud quite a lot. You know, so they really don't agree with each other on many things. However, they all agree on one thing, which is that meaning is central to human experience. Um, it is virtually what our psyche is based on. And the reason why I started this sort of photo album uh, with Freud is because of a book that he wrote, and it's quite a famous book, of course, The Interpretation of Dreams, where he outlined through perhaps sometimes a little crude examples, but the basic principle about how we form meaning. Um, we all know those dreams when we wake up and we're completely shaken up by what happened in the dream. And then when you think about the plot of the, of the dream, well, like what was the story about, it, it frequently makes no sense, you know. You were, um, you were haunted by, I don't know, FBI because you wanted to buy a washer and dryer and then aliens kidnapped you and suddenly you became your mother and you know you moved from LA to medieval France or something like this. So dreams can be seemingly completely meaningless, but when Freud would have his patients sort of free associate on these dreams, he would very frequently figure out what each of the elements of the dream meant because they would frequently represent another person or another event. And it's the technique of free association that, that Freud came up with uh, that, really, um, that really sort of is the basic mechanism of psychology, I would say. It sounds like an exaggeration, but it's not really. I, I think every school of psychology works with that theory of symbolism modified in some way. Um, so one thing associates to another, that associates to another, and so on and so on. So when I'm having a conversation with someone and that person suddenly starts you know, annoying me, for example, it could be that a gesture they made or a, their choice of words associated me to something else, and then that meant something to me, and then I reacted in the present moment. So even when we're interacting with each other, we're really always drawing on our past to find meaning. That's a, quite a simple idea, but it was also quite a revolutionary idea. Uh, and I feel the need to sort of separate this story of meaning right now in two different layers. One is the personal layer. That's what Freud was talking about, and that's what Kelly was talking about, and that's what Václavík was talking about, and John Dewey as well. But another layer of meaning is, is the meaning that we sort of adopt, that's implemented in us when we grow up. So there's the personal and then there's the social. And then there's this very special way that these two layers intersect in each and every one of us. And this is why I don't like general theories of skin picking or anything else, because my life experiences have taught me certain things. I'm sure all of you have different ways of, of conceptualizing the world. We all see each other in different terms, and we all see ourselves in very specific ways. The way I see myself may not be the way you see me and vice versa. So when we talk about meaning, even though there are shared meanings, the fact that you can understand me right now means that we share certain meanings, right? There are some written in dictionaries out there, but then there are also layers upon layers of meaning that are extremely and very personal. Uh, 
uh, often when, when people come to therapy for skin picking or anything else, uh, they will try to sort of show that there is no meaning in something. Because when we have a symptom or a problem of some kind, we really don't want to see that as a meaningful experience. It's usually just a nuisance we want to get rid of. So just today, uh, I had a client in SkinPick write me a message saying, well, it's all nice and well that you want to ask me you know, about my history with picking and how I started picking, but it doesn't matter how I started picking, I just want to get rid of picking. So then I explain and I say, that is true, but we do need to understand at least to a certain degree, what is the function of picking in your life? And then, you know, the reply is there is no function, it's just a habit. And then sometimes if I'm in a testy mood and if I'm sure that I'm not going to insult anyone, I will say something, well, if it's just a meaningless habit, why don't you just stop? And of course the answer is you can't just stop because it's not a meaningless habit. Uh, and also, if it's a meaningless habit, let's just replace it with reading poetry. Well, that also is not going to happen because reading poetry might be a meaningless habit for someone, although not to me, but it's not the same kind of meaningless habit that picking is. Uh, if something even becomes our habit, think about that, then it probably did have a meaning or a purpose. Otherwise, why would you include that in your repertoire of behavior? Now, a lot of these processes are not conscious, and therefore we don't know what the meaning is, but it is the assumption of psychology that it's always there. Uh, I, I would read this quote and then move on to another slide where I will explain in more detail how we form meaning and how we choose symptoms based on meaning. But this is a quote by John Dewey, um, who is a brilliant thinker, but the most boring writer you can possibly imagine. Um, so he says, uh, in a certain sense, every experience should do something to prepare a person for later experiences of a deeper and more expansive quality. That is the very meaning of growth, continuity, reconstruction of experience. So if you, if you ask yourself, what's the point of this whole meaning thing? It's to prepare us for life. Uh, because usually when we say meaning, we think of something very poetic, like, you know, um, well, whatever would be poetic for you, like looking at a good, you know, beautiful piece of art and then feeling on all kinds of beautiful things or seeing the person you like, you know, give you a present and then it's all very meaningful and beautiful. But meaning is actually a very practical thing. We do things because they mean something. And so meaning in a sense is always a guide for action in a psychological sense and in also a very practical sense. For example, I want to see myself as a good person. If I see a lady crossing that needs help crossing the street, for example, I will offer my help. Or if I'm in public transportation and someone needs to take a seat and it's an elderly person, I will you know, want to be a good person. So I will say, would you like to sit down? Um, so that means that the way I see myself and the meaning that I assign to this gesture is what makes me act. And different people will see this in different ways. If you, you know, if a psychopath sees an old lady crossing the street, he might think, you know, oh, great, let's have some fun, push her under a car. Radical example, I know, but it is an example of how one event can have many different meanings in, in eyes of different observers. So this is why it's very important to, to discuss and understand meaning in psychology, because um, what a symptom represents to me might not represent that to you. Those of you that work with me know that I usually just end my sentences with question marks, which is because I don't want to impose my meaning on you. I want to check it with you and see if it resonates, if it makes sense. If it doesn't, I have to throw it away because it's your meaning that I'm talking about. So let's now just go into a little more details and then I promise I will stop with the technicalities. George Kelly, the man I cannot not talk about. Kelly had this very basic metaphor that he built his whole theory around, which is that every person is a scientist, not the lab coat wearing kind of scientist, but he believed that in our everyday lives, by talking or making decisions or acting in any way, we are like scientists testing certain assumptions because that is basically what scientists do. They come up with all kinds of hypotheses, they test them, and then they see if they work. If they work, we call them theories. If they don't work, we just toss them away. 
right? And he says, this is exactly what we do in real life. And if you think about it, I'm sure that you will find that this resonates with a lot of your experiences. For example, you want to be a good person. You will, since apparently today, this is all about being a good person. Um, but that's the example that keeps coming to my mind. You want to be a good person. So you're going, you have a new coworker, for example, you're going to kindly approach them uh, and say something like, you know, if you need any help, let me know. If they say, yeah, great, I will, sure, thank you so much. You think, okay, so I tested the hypothesis that if I offer help to my new colleague, I will be perceived as a good person. You have received signals that tell you that you're a good person, therefore, good job, hypothesis confirmed. And then you will, keep using this way of acting in the world until one day it stops working. If on the other hand, you approach a new colleague, say, you know, I'll be happy to help. And they look at you and say, you know, talk to the hand. I don't know if people say that anymore, but if they, if they do, then if they say that to you, you know that this is not a way to approach colleagues. Uh, so then you will come up with another strategy next time and you will toss this one aside. This is basically how we create experience. and. And, and how we give meaning to the world and how we change meaning through our interaction with the world. Um, so that, that's Kelly's basic idea about how we create meaning. Uh, I will briefly switch to the guy on the right, the, the man with the impossible to spell last name, Paul Václavik. Um, he says that every problem that we have is actually not a problem, that it's really a solution. And that what is a sort of solution on level one is a problem on level two, but it's also a solution on some other level. Uh, this may sound like an abstract theory, but let me give you something that now during these times of quarantine, I think a lot of us can relate to. I certainly can. You feel maybe lonely or you need comfort of some sorts. So what do you do? You eat. So why do we eat and why do we have comfort food? For example, there are certain foods that I associate with better times, times when I felt good when I was little, when the world was kind of carefree. I don't know what that is for you, but for me, those are those little um, little Debbie rolls. Like they're not very healthy. There's, I think, like zero nutritional value in there. It's just sugar, basically. But, but I like them. When I eat a little Debbie, that just, just sort of transports me back into a place when life was much simpler. So when I feel that I need comfort, that's the problem. The solution is, well, let's just eat a little Debbie or seven. And then what happens after a month or two of eating little Debbies to comfort myself? I gain weight. Then I become very insecure and a little anxious and a little angry also about myself because I have now gained weight. And then I decide to be this proactive person that I am. And I say, so now I'm going to lose all that weight. I'm going to go jogging and I will immediately stop eating, you know, anything. Uh, I will go to the gym seven times a day. I will just, you know, exercise while I have sessions by moving my hands randomly, whatever. So just come up with this very radical plan about how to lose weight. And then because you can't eat any food, you're hungry all the time. And because your, your whole body is sore and you're obsessed with losing weight, you start to become frustrated because of course, you're not seeing results as fast as you would like because your body is not omnipotent. It has its sort of speed and the metabolism works the way metabolism works. And then you become, you know, very grumpy and irritated and anxious and angry. And so that's also another problem. And then you say, well, I should go to stress management, really. But then because you're eating a lot of little Debbies, you're exercising, paying for the gym, now you have to pay for anger management, then you need to get a second job as well, which then causes additional problems. Slightly extreme example. True, but I think it illustrates his point very nicely. The point is the following. We have, we need comfort. We solve comfort by producing another problem, which is gaining weight then we solve gaining weight by abruptly trying to lose weight with exercise and dieting, but then that causes our behavior and feelings to change, which then causes another level of frustration. So problem, solution, problem, solution, problem, solution. They just seem to be piling on and on. In medicine, this is also something that I think if there are any medical doctors here, that's something they, I think, live with every day. When you prescribe any medication that is going to help 
your patient, there's always a side effect. It's not something that can be avoided. So if we take this idea and then just slightly go back to Kelly, that means that even when our hypotheses work, they always come with a price. It may be nice to be kind to every new coworker, but if every new coworker takes you up on your offer of advice, you're going to end up exhausted. So that would be the dark side of your, of your little theory. So that's how we create meaning. And that's why meaning is never just this painless, beautiful joy. It also comes with burdens and prices. And in, in general, I think we have all been in these situations, at least adults among us in life, where you have to make a choice that is a choice that's going to make you feel bad, but you know it's good for you in the long run. That's one of those moments when you realize what the price of meaning is, how difficult it is, but how much we're willing to do for things that are truly meaningful for us. So just to summarize briefly, symptoms have meaning because they arise from our personal experience. So they never come out of thin air. Uh, symptoms don't just pop up randomly. Uh, they come from something that was already there before inside of us. They arise when previous solutions have very high price. So sometimes the symptom is already a solution to something else. I think a very obvious example with speaking is that sometimes people will have problems tolerating very intense emotions. And then when you become very frustrated or very angry or very sad or very lonely or very anything, uh, you can resort to picking because picking puts you in that kind of trance-like state where you feel absolutely nothing. So in a sense, that is a solution to intense emotions. Is it a healthy solution? I mean, no, but it is a solution. So why is it that you, you chose this solution and not something else? The key is always in your personal experience. So we always go back to the individual. Uh, this is not to neglect other aspects. I mean, sometimes there are cultural issues at stake and, and our family dynamics and all that, but all these things sort of live in us. We are a mixture of all that. And then something very individual, something else. And another thing is symptoms can arise when we're being bad scientists. So Kelly said that every person is a scientist. Um, sometimes scientists are not very good scientists and they prefer to keep their theory, you know, evidence be damned basically. And we, we, we all have this in life every day. Sometimes you will have an opinion, for example, you will share that opinion with your friends. They will counter you with very good examples that show that you're not right but you can't just admit that you were wrong, you know, can you? So you will try to wiggle your way around and come up with all these explanations about why you're right and they're really wrong. And then at one point, it will be very clear to you that you're just wrong, but you will stick to your guns. So that's when you're a bad scientist. There is evidence saying that your assumption is wrong, but you refuse to change your assumption. Uh, there is an anecdote that uh, a friend of mine told me, she was a, she's a philosopher, and she told me that one time when Hegel was giving lectures about history, about philosophy of history, one of his students raised his hand and said, uh, well, Professor Hegel, the, um, what you just said about history doesn't really work because, and then he gave him several historical examples that sort of go against what Hegel was saying. And Hegel looked at the student and said, well, you know, too bad for your facts. I'm sorry, but my theory stays. This is a situation where we're bad scientists. So sometimes we keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, even though it backfires and it doesn't work. And this happens because we don't have an alternative hypothesis. So sometimes in therapy, when we figure out where is it that you need a good theory? What we do is actually help clients create new theories so that then you can test them and see if they work. And of course, symptoms can be a mode of communication. Sometimes picking has a role in family dynamics. You know, sometimes picking is a message uh, along the lines of grossly simplified, see what you maybe do. Uh, there, there are numerous examples of this. One example that comes to my mind is the people who 
who are family therapists, they often see anorexia and other eating disorders in adolescents as a way to communicate with family members. It's a communication that's taboo on a verbal level, but you can then perform it, act it out. Uh, when I say perform it, I don't mean, you know, playing or pretending. I mean that your unconscious mind sort of produces a symptom as a way to communicate something that you've suppressed. Uh, so how is it that we go about discovering this meaning in, in therapy? I'm sorry for the lengthy quote, but I think it's a quote that very nicely summarizes how we go about discovering meaning in therapy. Uh, this is from, I think, the first chapter of maybe even the introduction to Kelly's uh, 1955 book called The Psychology of Personal Constructs. This is from volume one. He says, this theory of personality actually started with a combination of two simple notions. First, that man, sorry, man, this was written in 1955, so, you know, that man might be better understood if he were viewed in the perspective of the centuries rather than in the flicker of passing moments. So let me just stop myself right there. So we cannot just take a look at one event that triggered picking. We have to see your whole life story. Who is the person that came into this event to be able to understand the meaning that you assign to this event? So your history, rather than just these passing moments, is one key. To discovering the story. And second, he says that each man contemplates in his own personal way the stream of events upon which he finds himself so swiftly born. Perhaps within this interplay of the durable and the ephemeral, we may discover ever more hopeful ways in which the individual man can restructure his life. So there is the sort of long sort of era of time on which we string events together. And then there is our personal interpretation of these events that we come into contact with, right? So there's the world and then there's how we understand the world and how we act in the world and these two things sort of shape each other. And that's what Kelly tells us. He tells us, don't look at just this stressful event today that triggered you to pick. Look at this as a series of events. Why is it that you see this stressful? How did this become, to, you know, become stressful and so on? I'm going to give you a more structured approach to this in the next slide. But the point is, is that if you look at picking as only isolated episodes that have no connection to your life or your personality whatsoever, you're really very unlikely to ever stumble upon the meaning. And you're going to just see that as a series of meaningless episodes. But if you look at that sort of in the context of your entire life, the values you have, the family you grew up in, the family dynamics, the messages your parents, grandparents, siblings sent you about yourself, your experiences with your skin, with your appearance, with the way you relate to yourself, then you may get some more meaning around, around picking. So how do we do that in the skin pick program? Uh, this is just a very um, loosely sort of structured way because I had to represent it somehow. Uh, one thing that we do and that I usually start with is exploring the past. So, you know, how did you start to pick? When were you when you first picked? Um, how did you feel at that time? What was happening in your life? How did you get the idea to pick in that moment? Have you ever seen anyone else do that? Um, how did picking evolve over, over the years? Were you always picking, for example, your face or did it change? Did you pick your shoulders or abdomen or legs or, or private areas or back or, you know, your scalp? Where did you pick? Why did these picking sites change? So one way to go about that is to explore your past with picking. Then as we explore these events, we expand them a little more and then talk about what was happening in your life in these, in these situations. How were you feeling? Um, were you in a relationship? Were you, were you single? Um, did you want to be in a relationship? Uh, who did you live with? What did you do? So there are many, many aspects of the past that we can explore to give meaning to what's happening in the present. But that's never the whole story. Uh, another part of the story is exploring the present. So when you come to therapy, to skin pick or any other form of therapy, the there's always a question of why now? Uh, very rarely do we have clients who have been picking for two weeks. Because in two weeks, sometimes you wouldn't even call that a problem, right? Or even a year. Very often, 
people who come to the program are people who have been picking for four, five, six, 10, 20 years even. And, the, and some of them have tried to find help in the past, but most, believe it or not, have not. And then the question arises, why now? Why did you suddenly now become ready to deal with something that you were not ready to deal with before? Uh, what was the sort of, uh, what was the event that changed you and how did it change you so that you're now more ready to address this problem? Because that also talks about a shift in meaning. Um, let me give you an example that is not very personal or mine. Um, I can see that people are raising hands, so feel free to post your questions and I will answer them all, I promise. Um, so what was I, sorry. So yeah, so one example is that like a decade ago, or when was it? It seems like it was forever ago, when there was a public debate about legalizing gay marriages, for example. And there were a lot of opinions and, you know, people who were for it or against it. And then when, and when, when you look now, most people are for it. And many people have changed their opinions on this, not because gay people are different than they were 10 years ago. I mean, gay is gay. The reason is, is that through interaction and new elements and new information, the meaning of that has slowly changed for people. And this happens on a very personal level. For example, I've noticed, a, a, let's say, a trend that the older I get, the less I care about what people think and how I'm perceived. I have still retained my value that I want to be helpful to people, but my limits and boundaries have become much clearer to me. So that is a change. And so now I'm able to address some issues that I haven't been able to address in the past. So by just exploring why you're ready to deal with picking now or why you're not ready, you're touching upon what picking means to you. Another aspect in a way that you can do that is exploring your moment to moment experience. By this, I literally mean what I wrote there, which is when you start picking or when you feel the urge to pick, what happens? How does the urge evolve? In the beginning, I said that it's gradual for most people, but it's not always. If you observe carefully, sometimes urges will just spike for a second and then go away. Sometimes they will show up out of nowhere and then stay with you for an hour. What's happening in that moment? What do you think about? What is the general theme of your thoughts, for example? One of the ways in which we can catch meaning is by seeing what repeats all the time, because that means that that's important, obviously. Uh, sometimes when people describe falling into a trance, I will ask them to describe that trance to me. How does that look like? You know, and then the most common answer I get is, well, I feel nothing. Well, what's the experience of seeing nothing? How does that look like? Like, what does it mean not to feel anything? Uh, then, for example, sometimes people will say that uh, before they peak or after they peak or during peaking, they will feel pressure in their chest or they will feel um, like a sense of heaviness in their abdomen. One thing that you can do yourselves, you don't need me, is to just focus on that feeling. Just stay with it. Even if it's hard to describe with words, even if you don't really know what it means, just stay with that. Focus on it, kind of like when you do mindfulness and you focus on your breath, and then every time you, your mind wanders, you come back to the breath. You do the same with with the urge, and then every time your mind wanders, see where it wandered off to. What are the thoughts that come to your mind when you focus on the urge? And there you go, different aspects of meaning just emerge. It's not that easy, of course, to just write them all together and then see, uh -huh, okay, that's what connects them. But that is a process by which you will excavate enough information to be able to sort of assemble the whole, the whole puzzle at one point. And then this thing that I marked with this strange red shape, exploring solutions. Um, as you go through the program, uh, you will start with habit reversal techniques as, as most people do. And then you will have those moments when you say, well, I picked yesterday, but I didn't really want to do any of my competing responses. Yes, I had my fidget toy or my worry stone or you know, my infinity cube or whatever it is that you use, but then I told myself, oh, let me just speak for five minutes, who cares? So these moments, though not always, very frequently represent resistance. 
because that is one very conscious second when you can decide to take care of the, the problem and sort of redirect the urge to something else or to pick. And sometimes the choice is to pick. Again, I have to emphasize that the choice may not necessarily be conscious. Sometimes I know that the urge is overwhelming, so I'm not trying to put too much responsibility on your conscious mind. I'm just trying to say that that's one moment when you choose to keep the symptom instead of getting rid of the symptom. And that means that in that situation, there is something so unique to picking that there is a lot of meaning. It's very meaningful for you to pick in that particular moment in time. This is why when people feel guilty for just having a relapse sometimes, from my side, I always see that as a learning opportunity because that's where another layer of, of picking has just exposed itself. And it's a matter of sort of analyzing the moment in fine detail to figure out what it means. So those are very important moments to, to figure out. And then I will stop after this and go to my case presentation. So this is, um, I put a few verses from William Blake's Auguries of Innocence. Uh, this is of course not the whole poem, it's much longer, but I think he also sort of illustrates meaning very well in the first few verses. Uh, it's, it says, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower. And that is exactly what we do in therapy. You take a grain of sand, which is picking in this particular situation, and then you magnify it so much that you see a whole world in it. You see everything that's not visible with just not visible on the surface. You sort of go, you know, beyond the surface. You see its structure. You see what it's connected to, what you, what's, it, what's, what's it associated to in your mind. And that's how you discover meaning. And also, I really like the last two verses I quoted here. A dog starved at his master's gate predicts the ruin of the state. Uh, I mean, auguries of innocence are, of course, about corruption. Uh, but I like these two verses because sometimes they, uh, I, I see them as a very nice illustration of, of how, our, how our bodies sometimes react. When you don't listen to them speak softly, then they have to scream with symptoms. And sometimes speaking is the starved dog at his master's gate it tells you that you're missing something, something extremely important. You're not giving something to yourself. There is a need that can only be satisfied, you know, by the starving dog barking or by skin picking. And just as I'm saying this, something very interesting came to my mind. So I keep looking at the, the, the painting of the red dragon. It's a watercolor that William Blake did to illustrate the book of Revelations. Uh, and I'm looking at it the whole time, and it, one thing that came to my mind is this melody, which I know the melody very well. It's, uh, it's the aria from Bach's Global Variations. And it just occurred to me, why is it that I chose to use this as an example? Uh, I don't know if anyone, if anyone can make a connection here, but here's how meaning works. The first time I learned about William Blake, was not in school as most people do. It was actually in the early 90s when uh, Silence of the Lambs came out. There is a scene there where uh, Anthony Hopkins recites actually some of these verses, like a robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. And he does it with that nasal voice and with that kind of dry way of talking that he has, the, the creepy sort of Hannibal Lecter thing. And then in the movie Red Dragon, which is the last one that was made in the franchise, this painting actually features prominently. Uh, so this is something that completely eluded me, but there is, there, there's a level of connection uh, that goes beyond psychotherapy. So that's how meaning operates very frequently. You want to give a good example, you end up thinking about Silence of the Lambs. Because for me, that movie is like one of my worst nightmares when I was little and Anthony Hopkins and his face and all that. So this is, this is an example of how associations work. Well, I'm very happy about this and sorry for the digression. So now on to the, to the case report. I'm going to talk about a, a female client that I had and she struggled with skin picking. And I wrote here as the title, skin picking as an act of emancipation. And that, that it was for sure. Uh, but it was much more, and I hope you, I hope 
everything that I was saying in the first part sort of fits into place here. Um, so the, the woman was 36 years old when she started therapy with me. Uh, at that time, she was speaking uh, for over 20 years. She began picking when she was 14 years old. Uh, she says that she didn't really have acne because I asked about that because this is usually what triggers picking for, for people who start picking in their adolescence. She said she picked imaginary pimples. When I asked about imaginary pimples, it was really if she approaches the mirror close enough, she said you will find an imperfection to pick. So those were imaginary people, pimples. Uh, when she was in her teens, she experienced a, an episode of depression and she saw a psychotherapist for a brief period of time, but she never brought up skin picking. She told me that she was too ashamed, but that it was obvious anyway, because her face was even then scarred. At the time when we were working together, she had a few scars and also some discolorations on her face uh, due to picking. Uh, picking intensified after her father's death two years before starting therapy with me, and that was the cause to start therapy. Uh, she was married, she had two young children, and decided to start therapy because she felt that that would make her a better mother, um, you know, to set a good example for her kids. Um, she said that before she had children, she actually took great pleasure in picking. So the guilt was not as present as the gratification was. There was some shame, but the gratification part was overwhelmingly uh, more intense in her experience. So one thing, when I arrange our work together here, uh, it seems very, uh, very logical and very, um, it seems like it was a very neat journey, but trust me, it was ups and downs and this way and that way. I just sort of summarized it so that you can follow the story better. Uh, red moment, red, I colored in red every time she had uh, a, a, a more intense period of picking and uh, the bluish color there is when picking was not as intense. So it began when she was age 14. And when I asked what was happening in her life at, the age of age, at that age, she said, oh, life was good. It was great. It was excellent, actually. She was the best student in her class. You know, she was like the quintessential good kid. There was nothing at all wrong with her life. At the age of 16, she became depressed. That lasted about six to seven months. And she recovered with the help of her therapist. While she was depressed, she didn't really pick very much. Then again, after she stopped being depressed and she had her first relationship and she was valedictorian in her high school, so age 17, 18, she picked intensely. And this was also another life is good period because her boyfriend was someone that her parents approved of. He was um, like a good student, he was good looking, he was everything they could have hoped for, you know, for her daughter, for their daughter, sorry. Um, and she was also a very good student, so that was great. Life was excellent, except, of course, that she was speaking quite intensely. Then she went to college. It was in the same state, but in a bigger city. Uh, in that period, from the age of 18 to 22, uh, she almost didn't pick at all, but it was a very turbulent period in her life. When she moved to college, she started drinking, she started doing drugs. Uh, Nothing that we would call a full-blown addiction, but she used basically anything she could get her hands on. Um, weed and ecstasy and stuff like that. Uh, because of this sort of sudden change in her behavior, she was essentially in the constant state of conflict with her parents for, for four years. Uh, after she graduated, uh, she came back to her hometown and she got a job and soon she met someone and he proposed and she said yes because well they came more or less from the same social circles from the same let's say uh, uh, from the same type of background um, so he just seemed like a good fit for her however while she was you know employed and engaged she was speaking a lot and she wasn't really very happy even though she says there was nothing missing life was good at the age of 25 uh, she decides to break up with him. Uh, she's with her, with her fiance. She quits her job and stays a little more with her parents and then moves to a different city. So this time it's not in the same state. It's about as far away as you can get. So if she went anymore, it's like it was, she, she moved to New York. And if she sort of went 
A little farther, she'd have to build an island. That's how far she went from her hometown. When she moved to a bigger city, she changed her jobs. Her first job was in a bank, and then her second job was in a nonprofit, something to do with environment. And she fell in love with her supervisor or boss or whoever he was, and they got married. And this period from the age of 27 to 32, that was five years when she almost didn't pick at all. This was an interesting period, and I will come back to it a little later when we go into details. And then at the age of 32, her father suddenly died and she started picking again. Uh, except for, of course, this last part where her father died, there's a very common theme to all this. Life is good, I pick. I have problems, I don't pick. I don't know if that's something that, that you can see when you look at this, but to me that was quite obvious and to my client as well. After, you know, back and forth, for a few weeks, she was also able to recognize the, the pattern. So when she's being best in class and valedictorian and prom queen, and she has the perfect boyfriend and you know goes to church and dresses perfectly, she picks. So the first connection that she made was between emotional expression and picking. Meaning that when she was fighting with her parents and when she was going out and acting out in different ways, she wasn't picking that much or at all. But when she was being the good girl in her small town, that's when she was picking a lot. So naturally, I zoomed in on what it means to be a good girl, because if picking has to do with being a good girl, then we need to explore what it means to be a good girl. And so it meant that she has to be a good student, that she has to be very respectable, that she has to look very good because my God, women have to always look very good. And then she has to get married and have children. And then after that, she has to stop working. She has to become a mom and raise kids. This is not something that was, I think, ever explicitly told to her, but after she was born, her mother had stopped working at her father's request. And it was pretty much sort of implied that that is what her life was going to be. Whenever she defied those demands, her picking decreased significantly. And at some point in our work together, she started looking at picking as an act of rebellion. Because one of the key things for her father specifically was how girls are supposed to look and what it means to be a girl and what femininity means. And that included for her, you know, impeccable looks and good, pretty skin and, and you know, just sort of this kind of very, uh, like the, the sort of what you imagine when you, when you think of a perfect daughter, that is what he wanted to have. And she slowly began seeing picking as an act of saying, that is not who I am. At the time, her father was a very strong figure in her life. Um, he was, when, when she was younger, 14, 15, 16, uh, she admired her father. He was a very strong figure. He was very successful in what he did. Like, he was one of those, those parents that you trust them implicitly just because of the way they walk, talk. Uh, he was just like a good father to her. And it was impossible for her to say, look, dad, I do not want to be the girl that you want me to be. Because disappointing your father when you idealize your father is a very difficult thing to do. However, if you do pick your skin, then that's a problem and therefore, in a sense, not your responsibility. So picking was a kind of secret rebellion against these very, very harsh ideas, uh, ideas that are almost unattainable. When she met her husband, uh, she began to sort of explore this whole new approach to what it means to be a woman for her. Um, and to me, this is a very touching story because her husband seems to be a very accepting man. And for my client who grew up in a very sort of uh, strict family where there was no, you know, unwarranted acceptance, you had to earn respect and you had to earn acceptance. The, the idea that someone would ex accept all these versions of her was extremely liberating and really beautiful and appealing to her, but at the same time, terrifying. Uh, she recalled this situation, I wrote it down here in this, the, the second sentence, where one time he kissed one of the discoloration on her discolorations on her face, and she was completely overwhelmed and shocked at what he had done. Uh, she used to call these her battle scars. 
and he told her that it's because of the battle scars that he loves her because if she didn't have the battles that she did then she wouldn't become the person that he loves and to her that was almost like a you know like a sort of groundbreaking experience that someone can love her because of skin picking not in spite of skin picking that she became the person that she is by defying certain norms and she did that by picking her face uh, and early on in her relationship with her future husband then boyfriend she did a lot of experimenting um, in an attempt to sort of figure out exactly how accepting this man is because for her that was something that she definitely wanted for herself it felt good to be accepted but at the same time when you get something that is so new and so beautiful you always think it's too good to be true and my client was no exception so she would for example dye her hair or cut her hair very short short and then she would wear hats or or for example she would completely change her style of dressing she just wanted to see uh how long it will take for her boyfriend to say okay enough this is really enough and he said something that, that i kept repeating to her later on because i thought it was again a really very beautiful sentence and he said that not every version of you is my favorite but every one of you is okay meaning that maybe he prefers long hair and not short hair but hair or no hair or this kind of skin or that kind of skin he loves all of it and so this kind of acceptance gave her a, a, this new space where she could explore what it means for her to be a woman uh, her parents were not the biggest fans of her husband, although they, they did learn to accept him, but he was not the kind of guy they envisioned for her daughter. They called him the hippie, and that was not a good thing for them, for that family. So uh, when her father suddenly died of a heart attack, uh, she was naturally completely stunned. But what she talked about when she talked about that loss was uh, how strong she was. She had a younger sister, and she would often say how her mother and her sister were very weak, and they just could not stop crying, and you know you couldn't count on them to organize anything because, well, they were just so devastated and they were not strong enough to deal with the loss, whereas my client, of course, was strong enough. She even told me at one point that she had given herself one day to mourn her father's death one day and that she even allowed herself to cry during that one day but then afterwards she had to be strong and just keep going and after his death her picking just suddenly intensified it was almost dormant for for the time that she was married uh, and then suddenly it just came back even more intense than it was before and she couldn't really understand that and it confused her because when we finally talked about her father's death it seemed like all these theories about rebellion sort of um didn't work anymore like why would she be rebelling against the man who's no longer alive why would she be doing that um and from from my perspective it actually made a lot of sense because rebellion is the way she related to her father and by not mourning her father, uh, by being just so strong and by not crying and by just sort of dealing with it so well, she was actually, you know, perpetuating her father's ideas about what it means to be a woman. She was actually saying, well, look at my mother and my sister, these two women, they're weak, and, you know, feminine, and look at me, I'm so strong like my dad. By being so strong, as opposed to being weak as she perceived her emotions, she kind of held on to her father's narrative of gender roles. And then therefore, by proxy, she held on to her father as well. Picking was actually a way for her to stay in touch with him because the way they had spent much of her adult life communicating was through arguments. She was doing things that he didn't approve of. She was picking boyfriends that he didn't approve of. Um, she was picking her skin, something that he was very much annoyed by. And by continuing to do what was the cause of so many arguments, she was in a sense perpetuating her relationship with him. So in this sense, picking was not just a way to sort of free yourself from very limiting roles that you were put into. It was also a way 
to continue to communicate with someone who was no longer there. This was perhaps the most difficult stage of our therapy because it was something that she had never discussed with anyone before or herself, whereas she did talk and think about picking with other people. So the first stage of our therapy was kind of logical. It was about sort of looking at timelines and cross-referencing this or that and thinking, but this was very much raw for her. But once she started seeing picking as a way to sort of not let go of her father and a way to not mourn his death, we began talking about what it means to mourn, what it means to let go, what it means to never see again a man that you love so much. And then that's naturally where our therapy shifted to. Uh, we talked about strength and weakness, and we found a way to redefine that by using the concept of vulnerability, that someone can be both strong and vulnerable. She began with time finding ways to say goodbye to her father what, through what she called her little rituals. For example, she would have conversations with him. Uh, she would put a chair, sit across the chair and then talk to him. She would write letters to him. Uh, she would do th these little things to honor him from time to time. He liked drinking beer, a certain kind of beer, then she would drink that beer sometimes when she needed to feel his presence, for example. Uh, it's through these little things that she sort of slowly started to reevaluate uh, how to relate to her father. Um, she discovered, for example, that a lot of her life is shaped by the values that she got from him. In fact, she at one point said that in a sense, she's a better version of her father than he was because uh, she was able to extend and, and sort of update his values in ways that he couldn't. Actually, when we go back to the first slide with Freud and Melanie Klein, that's exactly what she did to Freud's theories. She updated them and made them better, but Freud just could not tolerate that and they did not have a good relationship, the same way that my client and her father didn't. And she says that it's by virtue of these values that he was, in a sense, still living inside of her. And then something very interesting that to me harkens back to the first, sort of to the beginning of the story, is that even when her values were directly opposite to those of her father, he was still there. It's kind of like with Freud. Today, a lot of neuroscientists despise Freud. And there are books and books written about neuroscience where people spend a lot of time just saying how Freud was wrong about everything. I mean, no one is wrong about everything. And Freud wasn't right about everything, to be sure, but he was not wrong about everything. But it's almost like people have to mention Freud because they, they are defined in relation to him. And this is the same way. So even when they fought and when they were the opposite sides of the spectrum, she came to be where she was because she opposed him. So even in where they were different, that was still in a sense thanks to her relationship to her father. Uh, the, the painting that I put here is maybe too colorful to talk about mourning, but I like what it means and like the symbolism. It's by this contemporary Cuban painter, Alicia Leal. It's called You Live Inside of Me. Uh, as you see, so this woman is carrying another woman inside of her, wherever she goes. And so after the, the process of mourning unfolded a little bit, that was followed by a significant reduction of picking and far more compliance with the techniques that we have been working on. Because for the duration of the program, we introduce different techniques to deal with picking, but then sometimes because of resistance or unwillingness to sort of accept the extent of picking or forever, for whatever other reason, people don't use these techniques. And when she was sort of starting to use them regularly, especially session six techniques uh, for this client specifically, um, that was a sign that she was really, really moving on because there was no resistance to healing. And after letting go of her father and mourning his death, her road to recovery was much easier. That's where it became a matter of just getting rid of the habit. And that's only because the layers of meaning underneath were excavated, you know, cleaned up and changed. Uh, I would like to end with another quote by George Kelly, 
which I think is an optimistic way to end my presentation, which is much longer than I wanted it to be, sorry. Kelly said, no one needs to paint oneself into a corner. No one needs to be completely hemmed in by circumstances. And no one needs to be the victim of one's biography. And I really like this because it says that we can take control of our lives and we can change in the direction that we want to change in. Basically that we can take our lives into our own hands. Um, so I will end with this and now uh, I'm going to take a look at your questions and hopefully get to all of them. So let me uh, let me start. If I have to leave the webinar early, will it available? On, will it be available on the website? Uh, so yes, you will receive the presentation in PDF. I think tomorrow morning, maybe, and it will be available on YouTube. So you will be able to find it there. Um, let me see. Um, what if some of our beliefs are just irrational? Is meaning irrational? Oh, well, that's a complicated question. Namely, I don't believe in irrational. Um, I think it's very dismissive of our personal experience to call anything irrational. Um, I think irrational is a label that I find acceptable, for myself at least, only until that point where I say that it seems irrational because I don't understand the logic behind it. Uh, you know, you never call your kidneys irrational. And unless you went to medical school, I bet you don't really know how they work. But you somehow think that there's, you know, there's logic there in how your kidneys work. But when it comes to our psyche, suddenly we're very willing to dismiss it as irrational. So no, I don't think beliefs can be irrational, which doesn't, doesn't mean that they can always be verbally justified. For example, I don't think we can fully justify our values. Because when I talk with clients and when we talk about how we identify and what our values are, uh, there's usually a rational explanation, but then as you go more and more sort of, as you progress behind these explanations, usually you get an answer like, well, because yes, you know, why do we value human life? Do we actually even need a rational explanation for that? Well, not really, but is it irrational to value human life? I don't think so. So that's my stance on it. I think there's always a logic, but the logic may be difficult to grasp. Uh, you say Kelly is a constructivist. Does that mean that he's a relativist? No. Uh, there are many kinds of constructivism, none of which are relativist. Uh, Kelly specifically wasn't a relativist. Uh, Kelly's idea was that, uh, this is why he used the metaphor of a scientist. Kelly's idea was that we don't have immediate access to reality or to other people's minds. So if I want to understand what you mean, for example, when you say, is Kelly a relativist? I have to ask you, I have to test some assumptions, and then some of my assumptions will work, some will not work. So even though we construct reality, it doesn't mean that you can just go around constructing whatever the hell you want. That just doesn't work that way. So no, he was not a relativist. He believed that like scientists, we create models of reality, models that have limited range of applicability, and Ultimately, he would say that we would never really know if they're true. We would just know if they work or if they don't work. But that's exactly how science operates. Sometimes actually in science, we use theories that are not entirely true because they work. Um, so that's, I don't think that's, that's a controversial issue. Uh, if every person is a scientist, then that makes people with symptoms very bad scientists, yes. Uh, I think I discussed this a little bit, um, yes. Uh, in some cases, yes. Sometimes we have evidence that, you know, picking doesn't really bring us or give us what it used to give us, but we still keep doing that. For example, a lot of the times people who have difficulty coping with, with intense emotions uh, or with anxiety, something that's very common. Uh, if you have a problem coping with anxiety and then you pick to zone out and separate yourself from anxiety, the moment you stop picking, it's going to come back with a vengeance and then you will feel guilty and you will feel shame in addition. So in that sense, you are a bad scientist because you're ignoring the feedback that your own psyche and reality are giving you. Yeah, but the story is a little more complex than that. How do you make connections between mindless speaking and meaning? Well, this is very tricky. Um, 
Uh, I think with mindless picking, uh, what we do in the skin pick program is the first two weeks you go through what's called awareness training and then, or through practicing mindfulness. Actually, you sort of gain more awareness of what's happening in your body and then how your body moves as well. So mindless picking becomes less mindless. In those situations, I think specifically, if you want to look for meaning, uh, the key is usually in how you feel or what you're thinking. It's not so much where you are, but what you're thinking about. I was a compulsive nail biter when I was a child. I stopped this maybe in my 30s and started picking the skin on my fingers. It is getting worse and worse. How can I stop? So, uh, well, one thing is obviously to seek therapy. So therapy is shown to be effective for picking. It can be a skin pick, but it really doesn't have to be. You can find a psychotherapist wherever you live or you can find a therapist online. If you want to do something on your own, um, that's not as easy as, as people might think, but one place to start is to download our app because it's a free app, so anyone can use it. It's called SkinPick, and you can use that app to monitor your picking. And then let's say after a week or two weeks or a month of self-monitoring, you can print out your whole report and try to figure out when is it that you pick, and what is it, what happens when you pick? What do you think about what you're feeling, how intense the urges are, and try to come up with some regularity. And then when you figure out what it means, you can find another way to get the, the same thing. If, for example, anxiety is your underlying issue, then you can address anxiety. That's how it works. But the most basic thing would be, for example, to start with habit reversal techniques. I think they will only take you so far, but that's, that's a good place to start. It will at least give you a degree of control over what's happening. Um, if I have, okay, so we already have answered this question. How do we trace our picking back to the beginning? Tips or tricks uh, when the start of this action is not clear? Okay, so one thing that I like to recommend, if you're not seeing a therapist or uh, you just cannot figure it out that way. One thing that you can do is journal. Uh, it's true. Sometimes when I ask people, you know, when did you start picking? They say, I don't know, somewhere between the age of seven and, and 19, you know, because we don't often remember. So what you do is you focus on the earliest memory of picking, the earliest one you can think of. Journal all about it. Journal where you were, uh, write what you were doing, how did things around you smell, any sort of sensory basic data. And just try to sort of stick with that memory a little bit. See what it reminds you of. And journal all the time. Every time you remember an episode of Picking from the Past, just write it down. Sometimes our memories need to be stimulated to, to sort of to come back. And also another thing is that you don't always have to go back to the beginning. That is a very Freudian idea to have to go, to have to go back to that one event that started everything, but that's not always necessary. You can discover meaning by talking about picking now or picking 10 years ago. For example, if you remember just a few minutes ago when I was talking about this client, uh, she could not remember. She only remembered that she started picking at the age of 14, but she said life was amazing. And she couldn't recall the first instance of picking. In fact, a lot of people can't, especially when it's been going on for a long time. But that doesn't mean that you will not discover the meaning behind picking. One way that I work with that is what I just showed you with my client. You can sort of try to emulate that process yourself. Because meaning is something that exists. It's, it's more of an abstraction of events uh, rather than the event itself. Because the only reason why we ever go back into the past is to understand the present and to find ways to act in the future. So you don't necessarily have to figure it out. Um, what if you can't remember when it started? Well, I think I just answered that question uh, unwittingly. Uh, you don't have to remember exactly when it started, but it does help to trace back how it evolved. So there are always different ways that you can, uh, if you remember that chart with sort of four different paths to discovering meaning of a symptom. It's not an exhaustive path by any stretch of imagination. It's just something that's practical to use. Um, that's something that, that you can use. Um, so another question. So I was very young when I started picking. How am I supposed to find my meaning? 
Uh, also, so like I said, you can do that by analyzing those events that you remember. And those, there's also another thing. I speak about meaning in very vague terms, but even with my client here, you can see that it was not just one thing. It was also sort of trying to, you know, free herself from a way she was perceived, but it was also a way to hold on to her father. It was also a source of shame and guilt because her face was discolor discolor discolored in places and she had some small scars. So that was also a cause of shame and it caused her to think badly of herself. So there are many layers of meaning. That's what I wanted to say. So it's not just one. If it were only one, it would be much simpler. Um, would you be able to talk a little bit about the connection between dermatillomania and existing skin conditions? I've always had both, um, but presumably with stress, the KP, the keratosis pilaris, has flared up recently, causing the dermatillomania to flare up too, itself causing stress. What would you advise tackling first, the physical skin condition or the psychological reasons behind the picking or both? It's the last thing you said, it's both. I think it's very important to tackle both because let's say you resolve the skin condition first, and then you don't feel the urge to pick. What are the chances that you're going to say, well, let me go and explore picking now when I don't pick? That usually doesn't happen. In theory, I'm sure you could, but in reality, that doesn't happen. In fact, we've had, I've, I've had, I can't speak for other therapists in the program, but I know that I've had cases with skin pick where people would, after session three, which is when you start habit reversal, they would find very good techniques very quickly. And then uh, they would sort of redirect picking or find a creative outlet for that. And then they would just sort of say, okay, we'll stop therapy now because I'm fine. But then after a couple of months, they would come back. So I think it's very important to address both. Obviously resolving the skin condition is not resolving picking itself. Um, uh, is finding picking is finding the meaning of picking something we could do for ourselves or should it be in the context of therapy well i think that depends on who you ask i'm not a therapeutic fundamentalist i of course think you can find meaning on your own i don't really think therapists are you know magicians that own super superpowers i think it's much i mean i, I don't get me wrong i love my job and i think it's a very good job to do, but of course you can do it yourself. I think it's more difficult because when you have someone else's perspective, something that might be very obvious to me might not cross your mind. And that's not because you're not smart enough to figure that out yourself. It's because it's your mind. The same way that some things that I do um, don't cross my mind. Some things that I say, I may not even notice that I'm saying. So the feedback that you get from the other person is very useful. But you can partially replace that by journaling or doing mindfulness and then sort of writing down your impressions for meditations and then periodically reviewing them. That Theoretically, that could also work. I do think therapy is faster, but I mean, if it works for you, good. Uh, what got you interested in working with people with excoriation disorder? Uh, well, it was, I think, a contingency more than anything else. Um, when I first, my first job out of medical school was at the Department for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And there was an adolescent girl who was, um, who had severe scars from, sel from self-harm, which was in the form of skin picking for her. And no one seemed to really want to take care of her skin picking. And then I thought, I mean, are, do people not notice what's happening? And then everyone would tell me, oh, that's just a habit. Like her problem is something else, but that's just a habit. And then I got a little bit upset that she wasn't taken seriously. So I sort of started working with her and it, I don't know, then she recommended me to someone else and just sort of went that way. That's not the only issue that I work with, but it is something that I care about. I tend to care about those areas of mental health that are very neglected. And skin picking and hair pulling, for example, are something that many people have. It's quite common, but for some reason, there's no research. And a lot of therapists will say, well, that's not an issue or, or I don't know anything about that. And then when I hear these things and I feel the need to, to do something about them. So that's my story. Make of it what you will. Um, how long does it typically take? How many sessions to discover underlying issues? Well, that's 
that's the question that I can't really answer because sometimes um, that depends on the amount of resistance and how long you've been picking on how prone to introspection you are, how much capacity you have to mentalize your emotions. Uh, so it depends on many factors. The, the skin pick program takes theoretically eight weeks. We have a lot of clients who choose to stay longer because it's kind of like an accountability um, thing as well. Uh, but in eight weeks, I think you can do a lot, but I don't think you can do everything. I think it would be unrealistic to say that 10 years or 15 years of picking can be entirely understood and resolved in two months. But what you can do is get a good overview and create sort of, let's say, a map of healing. So you can identify a lot of issues, but I don't think you have time to work through all of them in our program. But I've seen people do wonders, really, in it. Actually, sometimes I'm surprised by how much people get from writing about their problems because skin pick is entirely uh, in writing. So what you do is you chat with your therapist instead of having face to face sessions. And when I first started for the program with the program, I have to say I was slightly skeptical about how deep you can go. But then I realized that writing things down really has benefits that talking doesn't. Because I cannot tell you replay what you just told me in your mind, but I can tell you reread what you just wrote. So it, 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 it's really very individual. But for the duration of the program, I think you can do a lot. I'm sorry that I couldn't give you a precise answer, but I, I, it really is, it varies a lot. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Uh, did you ever have a skin picking disorder yourself? Um, I, I, don't really like to talk about myself in, in that way. I think um, that kind of puts me outside of my um, role as a therapist. So I'm sorry I will skip this question. It's not that I'm, uh, I, I have no problem. Like I, as you saw, I gave you some personal examples, but I think that as a therapist, I, I'm much better at maintaining boundaries if I don't talk about my mental health issues, unless my movie tastes are considered a mental health issue. Um, are there ways to stop using to stop using online therapy versus in person? Oh, you mean what's the advantage of online versus in person? Um, so uh, I think again it boils down to a matter of personal preference. Um, what I have concluded is that uh, online it's more structured because every session in SkinPick has its own topics. So you're kind of directed and guided through the process. Whereas when you work with someone face to face, then therapy tends to meander around. And also in writing, people seem to be more concise than they are when they talk, which is both good and bad. So they have advantages and disadvantages. I would say that if you're a person that has a lot of shame, uh, then written therapy, meaning skin pick, or if there are any other programs like that, then that would be a good solution for you. Because I've, I've noticed that in person, sometimes people will be ashamed to say something and then they will write me an email when they get home, for example. Whereas in writing, you don't really see me or whoever your therapist is. So that element of, of being afraid of judgment is much less pronounced when you do online. Are there any medications one can take? Um, so there are supplements that you can take. Uh, there is also medication that is prescribed. Um, the effects are, let's say, iffy. Works for some people, doesn't work for some others. Therapy tends to be more effective. Uh, I will talk about medication and supplements and all that in other webinars as well. So I wouldn't like to go into details now uh, because this one is more focused on the psychological side. Um, do you think progress comes in waves? Oh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, if there are any of my clients here, I, I must have told you at least once, if not 75 times, that progress is never linear. I have never in my life ever, I've been working as a therapist for, well, almost, well, over 10 years now, so almost 11 years. I have never ever seen anyone who had this sort of linear traje trajectory to getting better. There are always ups and downs. Maybe in an ideal world where life would stop for the duration of therapy, progress would be linear, but because life is very stressful and unpredictable, progress tends to go up and down, and that's perfectly normal. And it is very difficult when relapses happen, 
but it's also, like I said, a teachable moment. It's a chance to learn more about picking. So you can spend that time punishing yourself and being very hard on yourself for failing, or you can use it constructively and say, well, now that I have failed, it sucks, but let me at least make the best of this situation and then learn how to grow. You think if your client's dad had not died, uh, she would let the presence of him as a, how would she, and if you think, sorry, I'm just, it, uh, okay, so uh, the question is, uh, there's there's some, it, the word order is a little unusual, so it took me a second to figure out the question. So the question is whether or not my client would let go of her client as a, as a kind of authoritarian, authoritarian figure, and would she let go of anger that she had? Um, well, that comes down to sort of, you know, what if history. Uh, I've certainly seen people change the way they view their parents, even without therapy and even with them being alive. I certainly have that experience myself, and I think a lot of other people do as well. So yes, it's possible. But whether or not it would happen, I don't know. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you speak of talking to your clients. Do you have verbal conversations or only talk through writing in the program? So in the program, mostly it's in writing. I do have my own practice, but that's unrelated to this program. Um, and sometimes uh, people pay additionally for audio or video sessions, depending on whatever they like, but that comes at a significant cost. The reason why uh, SkinPick is an affordable program is because it doesn't include face-to-face -face sessions. As you know, therapeutic hours can be quite pricey. And there is one strange advantage that I realized with writing and not talking to a therapist is that you cannot have sessions every day face-to-face, -face, but you can write every day and then get a response. Um, can treatment for dermatillomania also help trichotillomania? Uh, yes. Um, there are some forms of trichotillomania that actually come with OCD tendencies and, and, um, and skin picking. So they overlap sometimes and they are very similar. They belong to the same, let's say, family of disorders called body focused repetitive behaviors. So yes, absolutely. The principle is the same, except that of course you have to adjust practical techniques, but yes. Uh, how can I prevent picking unconsciously? I often start picking without realizing that I'm doing it. Um, so one thing that you can do that's very cheap and affordable is to wear a very heavy necklace or something that makes noise so that you can be aware of your hands moving. That's one thing. Another thing that you can do is you can buy one of those habit aware bracelets. Uh, I don't think they will ever prevent you from picking altogether, but they will signalize when your hand moves towards your face or wherever you pick. So that's one thing that you can do. You can also do it a long way, which is practicing mindfulness and increasing body awareness. Uh, also, what I would do is I would take into consideration the situations where I pick unconsciously. Um, if it's, for example, because you're anxious, then anxiety is what you need to address, not necessarily just picking. Uh, you talk about habit reversal techniques is something that needs to be done after meaning is found. Does this mean that these sorts of therapists are ineffective without going deeper into path, into the past traumas, parenting styles, and so on. Oh, absolutely not. I, like I said about skin conditions and, and skin picking, I think those are all the things that you should do together. For example, in this specific program, uh, session one, I usually explore, you know, historical aspects of picking. Session two, it's usually about current picking. And then session th three is habit, is sort of, oh, sorry, uh, habit reversal techniques. Um, even though it's arranged in that order, we work on all of these continuously because once you start a session, you don't have to end it when the week is over. We can have all these conversations at the same time. In fact, I think, why should you stop reversing a habit just because you don't understand why you have it? I mean, you know, uh, it's like you shouldn't quit smoking before you figure out why you started smoking in the first place. I think it's perfectly normal and willing to, um, to work on both. Uh, I picked my scalp for 10 years, and I normally related with anxiety caused by my academic life. And academic life is too important to me. I think uh, I consider it more important than my health. However, it seems I don't have the will to stop picking because of the pleasure I feel in my fingers. And now in this quarantine period, it's much more intense. What tip would you give me? And thank you. Well, you're welcome. Um, so 
this is a very tricky situation, I will say. Um, and also maybe that will not be a very nice thing to say, but you are a minority of, of people who pick. Mostly the gratification is not as intense as the guilt afterwards. Uh, if you do enjoy picking, that causes an additional problem. So what I would try to do first and foremost is find a competing response technique that is almost as pleasurable. So it's not going to be completely pleasurable, but almost as pleasurable and start using that. Now, if anxiety is what you suspect is the underlying cause, there are very cheap ways that you can cope with your anxiety. You don't need expensive or fancy therapy for that. Mindfulness is a proven way to deal with anxiety. You can take, you can learn to meditate on your own. You can find, there are many Buddhist teachers who will basically teach you for free. Or you can learn for free. There are MBSR courses that are very affordable or even free. So th those are all the things that you can do to cope with anxiety. But what I would, for example, as a therapist, what I would ask you, so I don't know you, so I may be presuming too much, but you did clearly say that your academic life is more important than your health. Um, my question for you would be, is how, how did you become a person that prioritizes uh, academic life over your own well-being, for example? And if you're unhappy, how will you enjoy your academic successes, for example? Because that seems to be a very paradoxical thing. If that leads you into anxiety and picking, then can you really appreciate the joy and the meaning and the value that your academic life gives you? So that's also something to consider. If you need uh, any practical techniques, you can. You have my email down here. You can email me and sort of give me more details and I'll be happy to suggest something specifically tailored for, for you because from this, I don't really know when you pick, when you don't pick and stuff like that. So in general, you have two emails here. You have my email if you have any questions and then you have our support if you have any questions about the program or payments or anything of that sort. Uh, when I start to pick one spot, uh, I can't stop until all spots are picked. I have tried bandages, liquid skin, uh, I tried wearing gloves, I have discolored, discolored scars on my arms and lower legs. I'm afraid I have hurt myself as I have a hole in my nose through the septum the size of a nickel now. It cannot be repaired. I have a counselor, but the most frustrating is I don't know what if um, what I'm feeling when I'm picking, and I don't like the idea of gratification. I hate it; it's awful. But I don't even I don't, and I always eat that skin as well. Um, okay, so uh, you don't know what you're feeling when you're picking. This is something that happens quite frequently. Uh, what you need to do is stop focusing on trying to define the feeling. That is not a way, at least not a useful way to go about identifying your emotions. One thing that you can do is just pay attention to what happens in your body. Now, again, if my clients are listening to this, you know that I'm boring with talking about the body, but this is mainly how we can easily recognize emotions. So just focus on what's happening in your body as you pick and specifically before you pick. That's the most important, just before you pick. Uh, try to, you can download, for example, uh, body scan meditations. If you listen to my last webinar, then you must have received that email with links. And I put a link to University of San Diego's Mindfulness Center. They have several brief, uh, brief meditations that are quite nicely timed, I think. And also there are, in, 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 I think, at least English and Spanish, if not more. And you can start with these. And then as you develop more bodily awareness, you will be able to, to link sensations with thoughts and then understand what the emotion is. I regularly see a counselor, but I never mentioned skin picking to her. How do I bring it up? I'd really like to seek help, but I feel awkward and embarrassed to talk about it. Well, one thing that I would say is that you should have absolutely no shame in front of your counselor. If you're a therapist or you're a counselor or you're a social worker or anyone who's supposed to help with your mental health, if they shame you, they're simply not good at their job. It's as simple as that. Uh, we always, some, I mean, I'm, I'm human. I will pick clumsy words and say stupid things, but I'm always open to people telling me, don't talk to me that way or this feels hurtful. If your therapist is not able to give you that, I think the problem also might be there, might be the therapist. I understand the shame, 
But one part of therapy is that we should create a safe environment for people to talk about these things. If you can't tell her face to face, email her. Really, that's something that I find very helpful with some clients. When I see that they feel a lot of shame, and it's not even because they feel judged by me, it's because they feel judged by themselves. I will sometimes tell them that it's perfectly okay to email me something after a session. In our program here, of course, you can just write anytime you like, but email your counselor and then tell her in the email that you cannot talk about this in person and that you need to get it off your chest and that you can discuss a certain aspect. Once you write the email, read the email again, and then see what is least threatening to you, what feels least unpleasant, and then tell your counselor that you would like to start from there. But if you absolutely cannot open up to a counselor, then maybe it's also that you're just not a good match. That does happen sometimes. Uh, as a parent of an adult child with this condition, what would be your best advice to help? Don't judge. That's my best advice. Uh, most of the time when my clients talk about how their family and friends react, they feel very misunderstood and they feel judged. I think, you know, parents and, and, and loved ones, when, we, when they point out, you know, you're picking now, you're doing it again, it's always well-meaning. But for the person, you know, that has the problem, that can sound judgmental or it can add to their frustration. So I would start, maybe I would, well, I would stop pointing it out. But one thing that I would definitely do is I would simply ask your child, what can I do to help? And then listen, because no one can tell you what's the best way to help except your child. Some people like to be held accountable, so they need someone to point out when they're picking. Other people cannot stand this. So you need to do what helps your child. I would say that. So and the best way to find that out is to, to talk to them. Uh, does speaking at different parts of your body represent different issues? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Some people pick just where there's something to pick. It's, sometimes it's a matter of what's available. And sometimes yes. There are some instances in my experience as a therapist where uh, picking was also a form of self-harm. Uh, you know, like sometimes people will cut themselves and stuff like that. And then picking can come in as a form of self-harm. Not always, sometimes. And then it does matter. For example, with the client that I talked about tonight, she picked her face very specifically. She never picked anything that was invisible. So for her, it was very important that the places where she picks are visible so that people can see that she's not the pretty perfect little girl. So in that case, it was very important, but it's not, it's not always. Sometimes it's just what's available. Uh, does a change in antidepressant can cause um, the start of skin picking? I went from Prozac to Zola three and a half years ago, and this is when I noticed I started picking. Uh, I would not blame Zoloft. Uh, both of these drugs are in the same family of antidepressants, so that change should not be that drastic, which doesn't mean that in your specific instance it's not when it started. But before I would blame those drugs, I would consider what was happening in your life. Why is it that you switched drugs? And also, if, you're, if you think that's what it is, you should see your psychiatrist. He can maybe change it because Prozac and Zoloft are SSRIs and there are literally dozens of them registered. So one of them might actually be better for you. But I'm very reluctant with this little information to give a definitive answer. I find that when I try and limit my picking, I end up doing other habits that are equally as bad. Um, I sometimes uh, overeat or drink too much when I'm trying to distract myself from the urge. Why do you think this is? Okay, well, uh, this is actually a very nice example uh, of how a symptom serves a purpose. So when you cut, you cut off one way to satisfy a need, you will find other ways to satisfy that need, right? So it's, it's very simple. So one thing that you can do, which sounds simple, but it's not, is take all these bad habits and consider what's similar. So what's similar to picking, uh, overeating, and drinking? Sorry that I'm leaning in. I'm, as you can see, blind, so it's hard to read from, from the distance. I would consider what, what do these things have in common, and what's the exact opposite of all three? Because one thing that Kelly teaches us is that it's not just you know, one, the meaning always comes in pairs, so to speak. 
So to have happiness, you have to have sadness as well. And they're kind of intrinsically connected and one defines the other. And they have a kind of dialectical relationship. You know, to be a good person, you have to have an idea of what a bad person is so that you know what you're not supposed to be. And so the same thing is with picking and eating and drinking too much. Uh, they all belong to what Kelly would say, the same pole of a construct, but every construct has another pole. And if you want to understand what's in common, you have to figure out what's at the same time different from all these. That's a neat abstract concept, but it's not as easy to, to answer in real life, but that is a way to go about thinking about this. Uh, how long do you and your therapists work with each client? Sounds like you have a structured week by week plan. So does it finish when you come to the end? So um, when you say me and my therapists, it makes me sound like I'm the boss, which I kind of like, but I'm not. Uh, uh, so the program is structured. It takes eight weeks to complete, providing that you open one session every week as scheduled. Often people take two weeks or sometimes even three weeks depending on their financial situation and the rhythm that they feel sort of comfortable with. Uh, when you finish the eight sessions, uh, you can take additional sessions that sort of help you learn more about different aspects of picking or, you know, learn different coping skills and so on. And you don't have to take these sessions, of course. Um, you can just stay with the program and then we can talk about whatever it is that you like to talk about. So it's not limited. The subscription is monthly. So basically every month your sub subscription renews and you can stay as long as you like. What I like is to have a kind of plan with my clients and an agreement on what it is that we're doing and how long we're doing. But it, I don't, at least for me, it's really not an issue how long you stay. You can stay as long as you like. Um, is it also common to eat the skin that you pick like on fingers? Uh, and is that a different disorder from, from uh, skin picking? It's not terribly common, I would say in about, but this is my rough estimate. So I don't know the exact statistics, so don't hold my word for it. I would say in about 30% it happens. So it's not rare, but it's not terribly common either. And it's still skin picking. That is a phenomenon that we see um, uh, very often with uh, hair pulling where people will eat the hairs that they pull. And that also happens. And for this, I think I know the statistics, it's about 34 to 40%. Uh, and these two disorders are related. Uh, are there common reasons, uh, causes behind people speaking and other body focused compulsions like hair pulling? So in the beginning on the, I think it was the second or third slide or something like that, I did list some commonly found theories, um, but I don't think these are very useful because when you have a client, I mean, specifically, I don't want to name the person that asked because I'm not sure if it's not if they would like to be named, but I'm not talking to a generic theory. I'm talking to you. So I usually use these theories as kind of guidelines. Like they will tell me what types of questions to ask, um, but I don't use them as something that's firmly the truth. I mean, just on Friday, I was wrong, for example, and I asked someone if picking has to do with emotional regulation and they basically answered, what on earth are you talking about? Of course it doesn't. So, and it often does, and that's why I asked. I didn't ask in those exact terms, but it seemed logical to me, but not to the client. So you can take a look at the list in the beginning. I took that list, I believe, from um, Kaplan and Sadok's synopsis of psychiatry. So it has like a page about skin picking, unfortunately, but that's what it is. Um, do you think that online therapy is just effect, as effective as face-to-face -face in the context of skin picking and the program that skin pick offers? I live in a rural area and no doctors or therapists or psychologists know much about skin picking. Um, so there are no studies that compare online and offline therapy for skin picking. As you can imagine, there are barely any studies that, that address skin picking in any serious way. Um, so I can't give you any empirical science-backed data. In my experience, uh, both work just as well. The offline program is very structured, so you know that at week three you will get habit reversal techniques, and I don't know, week four you will learn to work with your values, week five it'll be mindfulness, or if you work with me it'll be from week one, week six it'll be cognitive diffusion techniques, and so on and so on. So in that sense the online program is very structured, 
Uh, the only issue I have with the online program is that if clients are not very motivated to work, then they will not log in very often. So I don't have a lot of control to work with resistance unless you show up. But that just means that I have less powers, but you know, the, the, the motivation to change always has to be on your side. But yes, you can stop picking. Thank you. I had a strong emotional release going through the case you outlined. It was very powerful. Well, I'm, I mean, I hope that the emotional release was a good one. And in that case, I'm, I'm very happy. I was a little bit um, concerned if some people will find the case triggering, but I think it's much better to actually show how these things are done than to talk about Freud and, and Lacan. How do you sign up for skin peak therapy? Well, you can go to the SkinPick website or email our support. I'm sure they will be happy to send you all the information. Are there any genetic components, uh, siblings picking? So when you have other family members picking, uh, I think it's because we're conditioned to think a lot in biological terms. Genetics is the first thing that comes to our mind, but there's also something else. If you have family members picking, then you have the same or very similar family dynamics. So that could also be the thing. Just because something is present, psychologically speaking, in families, it doesn't mean that it's genetic. Actually, we very rarely have such specific cases of inheritance, I think, in, in the area of mental health. Um, I mean, we do when it comes to breast cancer, but that's a whole different ballgame. So I will talk about genetics and um, and generally these sort of neurobiological studies next time. So join in and then you will learn more. But my default way of thinking about pickings, picking uh, and siblings would be family dynamics. Is skin picking a lifelong battle or can you overcome it? Uh, I think you can definitely overcome it. But I think, uh, so, we can't really speak for everyone in this case. There are some people who will, to an extent, pick throughout their lives, and everyone can manage it. Of that, I am sure. Uh, some people will entirely get rid of it. Some people will keep it under control. And there are not enough studies to tell you exactly the percentages of which, I'm afraid. Uh, I know that sometimes I look at our program statistics and that over 90% of the people have significantly reduced symptoms, which means that almost everyone who signs up for the program will be able to control picking better. But whether or not it will be a lifelong battle, you cannot give a generalized answer to that. But there is, I'm not very optimistic. As you can see by my name, I am European. We're very morose and pessimistic people, but still I cannot say that you can, that it will be a lifelong battle because it doesn't have to be. I do would like to sort of emphasize that the longer it's been going on, the more difficult it is to resolve in my experience. Uh, I did recently bring this up to my therapist before COVID, cut back on in-person appointments. She said uh, she, should, she would have to look into it more. Uh, what do you think that the cause is for a little research and help, stigma, embarrassment, and so on? Well, I'm not quite sure, to be honest. I think stigma has a lot to do with it, but it's not like we don't know that it happens. So you can, today, you can make a very, you can very easily do research by just sort of giving people anonymous, um, you know, polls to do, and then you can see how prevalent it is. It's not, you know, it's not very complex. Um, I think it's just not one of those, uh, like for example, there are certain disorders. There was, a, there was a very famous critic of psychiatry and he was also a psychiatrist. His name was uh, Thomas Sass. And he once called uh, schizophrenia the sacred cow of psychiatry. And it's usually the sacred cows that get all the attention. Now, for example, uh, I remember reading once in the synopsis of psychiatry that I mentioned, because that is more or less a Bible for, for my profession. Um, they said that, that, for example, hair pulling has been known to be a, an issue that people struggle with, I guess, you know, disorder, if you can call that, since the, since the 12th century. So it's like 900 years, and we have very little research. Whereas, for example, schizophrenia was recognized as one disorder like 100 years ago. So I think there are some disorders that just don't, are not perceived as equally important. But I pay attention, I said perceived, because in my experience working with people who have skin picking it is a very, I mean, the, the suffering that it causes and the shame, it's, it's actually sometimes much more than for depression or bipolar or, you know, or stuff like that. 
So I think it's it's just not one of those um, flagship disorders, let's say. I could go into criti criticizing my profession uh, for a long time, but I will tr am trying to restrain myself. Um, uh, once you've identified your meaning, what do you do with that? So if you pay attention to my, um, to the way I worked with this client. So um, uh, when you, once you identify what a behavior means, uh, you can go both ways. You can go towards behavioral modification or you can go towards changing meaning because meaning is not fixed, right? Meaning is just the way we structure our experience. And because different people assign different meaning to the same thing, that just tells you that meaning can be changed. And you can change that through working with your therapist or just sort of finding different ways of telling the same story, let's say. There, if that's something you'd like to work on yourself, there are many resources from narrative therapy, for example. Uh, that Narrative therapy, of course, is not self-help, but I find that the, the way they approach some issues is easy to adapt to working on your own. But meaning can be changed. That is the core of therapy, basically. Okay, so uh, are there any hereditary connections? I already answered this question partially, so I would not like to get into that because there are so many questions left. Um, how do we sign up for the program? So just go to the website or email our support and then they will give you all the information. Thank you, this was useful. I'm happy if it was. Um, how do I strengthen my will to resist picking? Hmm. Um, that's a tough one. Uh, I think the first thing would be to elaborate your resistance towards treating picking. Uh, when we don't want to change something, that's because what that behavior means or what it represents to us is, is not replaceable in our minds. So for example, um, um, like I'm not very popular among my friends because of my musical choices. I like classical music and jazz and no one really likes that. And then um, if they come to my place, I'm absolutely forbidden from ever playing music for them. They have to play their, you know, bad music. But I would never trade my classical music or jazz for anything in this world like for nothing. There is only one Prokofiev in the experience of listening to him because it is very meaningful to me. So um, in that sense, uh, that's why I don't want to give up that music because the emotional experience that I get is just so powerful and so unique. Uh, I'm, For example, I'm specifically referring to his third concerto. Uh, the last movement is just something that that I, what I feel when I listen to that, I have absolutely no other way to access that emotion. There's something just so profound and primordial, it's just wonderful. And because I have no other way of feeling that, that specific piece of music will be unique to me. But once I understand a little bit better, what is it that, that's so unique about that experience? What does it mean to me? Then I can find other ways to get that, the same thing. So that's what you do when you work on resistance. You try to identify why is picking so unique? What is it that picking offers that nothing else does? I know it's, it's not very intuitive to think of picking as something that's useful, but if a behavior persists, it's like with evolution, you know, traits sometimes persist because they do something very important. Once we evolve kidneys, we're not going to unevolve them, right? And so the same thing goes with picking, except that here we have, of course, more control. So you need to figure out what is it that it does that nothing else does. For a few months, I've stopped biting the skin on my fingers, but now I'm constantly picking at scars and scabs all over my body. Am I actually making any progress? I don't think I can answer that question because I don't know you very well. So I don't know the circumstances through which you stopped picking and then why you started picking again. And then what does it mean to pick scabs? But if you are in the program and if you have a therapist, by all means, ask that question. They should be able to answer it or at least offer you know, a conversation to find the answer. Uh, why are there so many terms to describe this? Uh, so excoriation, BFRB, dermatillomania, SPD. Do you think this makes the problem harder to address? Um, well, the, the nosological system, the DSM or the ICD that we use is like that. It's very descriptive and it likes to tear everything down, usually for purposes that have nothing to do with medicine. 
Uh, and sometimes the, the diagnostic syndromes that we have are based on statistical cluster analysis. So it's not really addressing the underlying cause, rather only the diversity of symptoms. So that's why. I mean, I agree, there are many overlaps between, for example, all body-focused repetitive behaviors. But when you look at the way that the diagnostic manuals are structured, then that's what you get. But I don't think that's why there's not enough research on the subject. Could you please talk more about the connection with smoking? Um, so I wasn't, I, I was giving that as an example, but I don't think I made a direct connection. But if you feel that there is, I mean, feel free to email me and I would love to answer your question, but I really need a little more detail. Um, so as far as I can remember, I've always picked at my skin and I have never had any kind of trauma or event like that happen in my life. It's just always felt normal to me. Um, so how do I find what it means? Um, yeah, that does make, make it more difficult to find what it means, but it is not impossible. So then what I would do with, in your specific case is I would start from self-monitoring and seeing in everyday life, when is it that I feel the urge to pick? And I would pay attention to two different things. One, when is it that I have to follow through on the urge and pick? And when is it that I can control myself? and then start from there. Because there you will immediately get two distinct classes of urges. So you will be able to elaborate meaning a little more. And then as you do monitoring, of course, you just sort of observe what themes are repeating themselves. How do you differentiate between picking and self-harm? Again, it's about meaning. So um, on the surface, it's very hard to differentiate, especially in the more extreme cases of, of picking, but it's you know, the intention behind the act is where the meaning is. Uh, sometimes I will say something very clumsy, but not because I want to be hurtful, but because, you know, for example, at this point, I've been talking for almost two hours. So if I didn't say at least 20 stupid things, you know, it, it's almost impossible. But it's not because I wanted to come across as, as a stupid person. It's just that my brain gets tired after a certain point. So that's how you differentiate. You have to ask me if you're talking about me. So with you, you would have to explore uh, well, with self-harm, for example, the kind of self-image that you have, uh, are you maybe too hard on yourself? How do you feel about different aspects of yourself? How do you feel about your body? Uh, you're about your self-esteem and stuff like that. And then try to differentiate that from some things that picking usually gives, like gratification, for example. Are you doing it for self-soothing or to punish yourself for doing something badly? That's one way to differentiate. And I have to say there are situations when there are there are two. I just downloaded the app. I have been able to reduce sessions from 20 minutes to an hour uh, to less than five minute sessions, but more of them throughout the day. Should I record every one of those sessions? Well, that depends if you're in the program or not. Um, if you're in the program, I think you can speak to whoever your therapist is. And then you can discuss sort of what aspect of picking that you can pay attention to more, what would be useful for you in this moment. But if you're doing this alone, one thing that you can do is sort of first stop monitoring focus picking and focus only on the mindless automatic picking. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice at this point. Uh, focus only on automatic picking because that's generally more hard, more difficult to control. So start with that. Or if there are any um, go through your log, for example, that's one thing that you can do. And just notice um, where, what you can connect with the strength of the urge and let's say your thoughts or external, uh, external circumstances. And then whatever conclusion you come to, just focus on monitoring that as well. Because monitoring has basically two purposes. One, to give you more data to understand picking better. And second, to make you more aware. If you're already aware, then maybe you can neglect those aspects of of picking and then focus on, on sort of gathering data for the more puzzling episodes of, of picking. Um, why are there so, so few studies? I already addressed this, it's a, it's a mystery to me, but you, when you talk about research, you have to sort of keep in mind that, you know, scientists, um, therapists included, we like to feel very, very important. So we have to feel like we're, you know, doing something revolutionary. And then I think skin picking maybe 
because most people look at it on the surface. Um, they don't see the depth of the issue, for example. Then also very few people actually complain to their mental health providers. People will go to see a psychiatrist for depression, anxiety, anything else. But when it's just speaking, they will say, I'll handle this on your own. So one part is how you know studies are financed and how much research interest that is. But then on the other side, there's also this aspect that not many people actually go and complain about the problem. Because one way to get, you know, let's take the COVID-19 situation. If we didn't have, you know, millions of people infected and hundreds of thousands of people dead, would we be doing much research? No. So one of it is increasing visibility. And when you have a lot of shame, then the problem stays invisible. I think so that could also be a part of the problem. Thank you so much from my heart. Well, you're welcome. A uh, long time classical music lover and big band. I understand the emotional experience, uh, in particular, something about the seasons. Well, I'm glad there's at least someone there, um, someone there who understands me because my friends most certainly don't. Um, once when they tortured me with pop music for about two hours, one of them looked at me with this sort of uh, pitiful look in his eyes, one of my friends and said, it's okay play one of your, your half an hour piano pieces. And I was like, thank you, finally. Um, thank you for your generosity and your time. May you be well. Well, thank you so much. Happy to help. Um, is there a typical demographic or type of person that suffers from skin picking? Like perhaps it's typically women or younger, younger people. And thank you for answering these questions. Well, you're welcome for the latter one. So it's the, demographically, it's more common in women than it is in men. And it can have onset at any period. It can start in your childhood or your adult life. Um, I would say roughly, I don't have the statistics, but if you want to know, I can check my synopsis of psychiatry, which is in a different part of the room. So I would have to go and dig through my bookshelf. Um, I think, I believe that about half of the cases start in adolescence. And then as you become older, uh, there are fewer and fewer new cases. Thank you for the seminar. So some of these are thank you notes. And whereas I'm very grateful, I feel a little uncomfortable reading them all because it sounds like I'm thanking myself. But I, I'm very grateful if this was useful to you. Um, I write poetry. Can I use that to figure out what picking means for me? Yes, of course you can. I mean, I quoted William Blake, for God's sakes, anything's allowed, sure. Um, okay, so there's some more questions, but I have already answered 58 of them. So let me just get one more. I, I apologize, and then I, I think it would be time to stop. Um, thank you, this has been very helpful. Uh, I have often felt like I was the only one going through this, but skin pick and this presentation have helped me feel like I'm not alone. Uh, this has actually helped me motivate to keep moving deeper in my work. Well, I'm very happy for this. And I have to say something to all of you still listening and uh, you know alive from me talking two hours. Um, there is a forum on the skin pick website. Uh, I think you can find the link on the main page. If you can't find it, you can send me an email and I would be happy to send you the link. From what I can see, people don't use the forum very often, but I don't know why. Because a lot of people feel lonely, I think it is almost as valuable as therapy to actually exchange your experiences and, um, you know, and sort of just be there for each other. Because I think people who suffer from skin picking can be there for each other and help each other and understand each other and offer useful advice sometimes more than therapists. Not that we don't want to, but someone may have had the exact same experience as you did and they may have found you know, a solution to something that you're looking for. So I would encourage you all to visit the forum and, and uh, post there and discuss and talk. Um, I think that would be, that would be a good way to feel less lonely. So um, I think I would like to see that there are still questions that I haven't gotten to, and I really apologize and feel free to email me. I will e answer everyone, maybe not immediately, you know, because I do work and have sessions, so I will, but I will answer everyone. Uh, but I think it would be a good time to stop 
now because I am at this time losing my voice and need to rehydrate. Um, I would like to thank everyone for having the patience to stick around with me for over two hours at this point. And thank you for asking questions and sharing stories. And um, hopefully I will see you all next month and then we can talk about more aspects and, and different aspects of skin picking. Um, I don't know where you are, but so have a pleasant evening. And if it's night, then have a good night. <laughs>